Welcome to Ruud's History and Philosophy vlog. In this episode we will talk about communism, class struggle or anti-imperialism. In this podcast I want to philosophize on the ideology and practice of communist revolution. I am not endorsing or rejecting communism or any other ideology for that matter. I merely want to analyze from an historical perspective the similarities between the successful communist revolutions of the 20th century. Was class struggle the driving factor behind these revolutions as Marx and Engels predicted? Or did anti-imperialism also play a significant role? Communism goes back to Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels who conceived an idea about class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. This struggle would in their mind be inevitably won by the proletariat. According to their theories, the preconditions for a successful class struggle were twofold. First, rise of the bourgeoisie to overcome the feudal order of kings and noblemen. Second, industrialization for the creation of a sufficiently large urban proletariat. In anticipation of the cataclysmic class struggle, Marx and Engels lived their lives of political activism in the most industrialized nations of the 19th century Europe, Germany, Belgium and England. After their 1848 communist manifesto, there was however not one revolution attempt in these countries during their lifetimes. By the end of the 19th century, the cause of socialist revolution was seemingly getting nowhere, as European socialist parties committed themselves to the parliamentary process rather than violent uprisings. Class struggle became more and more a hollow phrase. The cause of socialist revolution was not rekindled by class struggle, but by anti-imperialism. In 1917, Lenin published a brochure titled Imperialism is the highest form of capitalism. Lenin managed to incite revolution by tapping into Russian discontent about the course of the First World War. Russia was being used by France to keep Germany at bay, and that came with a tremendous cost, millions of dead Russian soldiers, and a collapsing Russian economy. In 1917, the Russians had enough of the war and even the deposing of the Tsar and the installation of a civilian government could not satisfy them. The subconsequent Bolshevik revolution of Lenin was a, re a revolution primarily carried by disgruntled soldiers with mainly farmer backgrounds. Not the worker proletariat as Russia was hardly industrialized. The revolution was directed against the continuation of the war against Germany by the civil government of Kerensky, a social democrat, and the stranglehold of foreign interests on Russian foreign policy. The first goal of Lenin's government was peace with Germany and the annulment of all obligations and debts to foreign governments. By doing this, Lenin became in one stroke the quintessential anti-imperialist. The anti-imperialist credentials of communism were not lost to other nations. The Peace of Versailles in 1919 triggered Chinese nationalism in the form of the May 4th Movement, which campaigned against the Allied decision to give the German colony of Qingdao to Japan rather than give it back to China. This movement tapped into a wide discontent about Western imperialism in China. The Western powers had begun petitioning China into spheres of influence and stationed troops on Chinese soil in the end of the 19th century. The Chinese Communist Party had its origins in this May 4th movement and it gained popularity by its anti-imperialist struggle against Japan from 1937 onwards. The Communists didn't did not engage in class struggle, but in national liberation struggle against foreign imperialism. It was even prepared to work with right-wing nationalists in this struggle. When the Chinese communists won the civil war against these nationalists 
1949, their revolution had the same immediate result as the Russian Bolshevik Revolution. All foreign influence was expelled and national sovereignty was restored. We can see the same pattern elsewhere. The anti-imperial struggle was the dominating factor in the rise to power of the Vietnamese and the Cuban, Cuban communists. In Vietnam, the communists came out on top in 1954 in their struggle against the French imperial ambitions and gained independence in North Vietnam. The subsequent American intervention in South Vietnam further played into the hand of the Vietnamese communists. Now they could claim to fight another anti-imperialist war of national liberation against American intervention this time. It gave them a lot of sympathy at home and abroad. The Cuban Fidel Castro went even further than the Vietnamese communists and avoided the communist rhetoric altogether. His July 26th movement was a mixture of left-wing nationalism and anti-imperialism. This was a sensible approach. America was an American colony in anything but name, and the brutal dictator Batista was largely seen as a puppet of the Americans. Nevertheless, the key positions within the July 26th movement were taken by hardline communists, like the Castro brothers and Ernesto Che Guevara. They only came out as communists after the success successful overthrow of Batista in 1959. It led to the same result as all previously mentioned revolutions, the expulsion of foreign influence. The communists themselves also saw there was a much more potential in engaging into anti-imperialist struggle than into pure class struggle. China. Russia and even Cuba sponsored all kinds of anti-imperialist groups in Africa, South America and the Middle East to this end. The irony is that the only successful communist uprisings were based on anti-imperialism mixed with nationalism rather than class struggle. Contrary to Marx and Engels' prediction, there was never a successful revolution in any industrialized nation.